The DVD and Blu-ray version of Tucker and Dale vs. Evil contains a special feature that lets you watch the movie from the perspective of the college kids and turns Tucker and Dale into murderous villains. I have purchased the Blu-ray DVD just for this reason. <laughs> Listening to the Cabin of Horrors podcast. Go behind the scenes of all your favorite horror movies from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and now. I am your host, the Incredible Josh. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Cabin of Horrors podcast. We're going over literally my favorite horror comedy of all time. Period. I know many people will say Shaun of the Dead is the best horror comedy ever, and I'll give credit where credit's due, because Shaun of the Dead is a great film. It did a great spoof on the zombie genre, but I feel that what Shaun of the Dead did for the zombie subgenre, Tucker and Dale vs. Evil did for the slasher subgenre, because it spoofed it, but in a way that didn't seem scary movie-ish, you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't an overdone spoof to the point where it was ridiculous. Like, it was ridiculous, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't done in a way that was super campy and just trying to get cheap laughs. I guess that's the best way I can explain it. Tucker and Dale vs. Evil took the slasher movie, took the tropes and the stereotypes, and then turned it on its head and really made a film that, in my opinion, is iconic and is great commentary on the slasher genre and the different kinds of tropes and stereotypes that you see in slasher films. And it's just hilarious. It's super hilarious. A big case of misunderstanding. That's that's the if I were to describe this this movie in one word, it would be misunderstanding. <laughs> because it's just insane what happens in this movie, and the one-liners in this movie are classic. If you've never seen Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, I implore you, please, if it is not anywhere available in your country for streaming, like for free on, you know, Netflix, Tubi, Prime, whatever, pay to rent it. I'm serious. Pay the money to rent this movie, because you will not regret it. If you are a slasher fan, if you are a horror comedy fan, Trust me, if you have not seen this movie, you are missing out. Like, there's there's no way around it. If you haven't seen Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, you are missing out. It is by far the funniest horror movie I've ever seen, and to this day is my top horror comedy. I watch it on a regular basis, just because I love this movie so much. And it's a shame, because it wasn't as successful as I feel like it should have been. I don't know if it was a promotion issue, marketing, or just... It wasn't released widespread enough, but it wasn't as much of a box office success as I feel like it should have been. It wasn't a flop. We'll go over that in more detail here in a little bit. Like, it wasn't a complete flop, but they pretty much broke even. Unfortunately, during my research here, I didn't really find as much behind-the-scenes stuff as I normally do for other movies on the podcast. There just isn't much for it, unfortunately. But that's okay. We'll talk about what we have, we'll talk about the movie itself, and I'm going to do my best to explain how amazing this movie is, because I really hope if you haven't checked out this movie, you're going to go check out this movie now, because it's so underrated, and it's it seems almost underground, like a lot of people haven't heard about this movie, yet it's up there for me with Shaun of the Dead. Like, it's, it's up there right beside it when it comes to horror comedies that provide a commentary on horror subgenres. So all I've got on the production is that it began in June 2009 by casting the actors. They then started principal photography one month later in Calgary, Alberta, and then in October of 2009, post-production ensued in British Columbia, and the first time we saw any stills from the movie was part of the American film mark in that same year. The film went on to premiere on January 22, 2010 at the Sundance Film Festival. And on March 12, 2010, it was part of the South by Southwest Film Festival. It was then distributed by Magnolia, and it received a limited theatrical release in the U.S. on September 30, 2011. 
On its opening weekend, the film only grossed $58,843 from 30 theaters. It then went on to gross a total of $223,838 in the U.S., and it grossed between 5 and $5.3 million outside the U.S. And the budget for this film was only $5 million. So they made about, what, $5.5 million globally? So they didn't really make much of a profit. They still did. You know, on a $5 million budget, they made half a million dollars. But for, for a film, half a million dollars isn't really looked at as a success. It's not looked at as a money-making machine, right? They were hoping this movie would make millions, and it didn't even make one million, unfortunately. And like I said, I'm not sure if it's the limited release that did it, or if it was a lack of marketing, or maybe the time that it was released. But it's just nobody went out to see it. Nobody really watched it. I feel like, though, it's gotten a new life through streaming platforms, because that's even how I heard about it. I never heard about this movie when it first released, which surprises me because I'm actually a huge Alan Tudyk fan. I love Alan Tudyk. I've watched pretty much every work he's ever done, any TV show, any movie. I love Alan Tudyk. I'm a Wash fan. For any fans, for any people who know, if you know, you know, I'm a Wash fan. So, uh... I love Alan Tudyk, and I never heard of this movie until probably four years ago, maybe four or five years ago, when I was scrolling through Tubi, and I saw this movie, and I saw it had Alan Tudyk, and it had Tyler Labine in it, too, and I, I like Tyler Labine, so I was like, well, I'm curious. I didn't watch the trailer. I read the synopsis, and I was like, okay, it's going to be campy. That was my first impression. I'm like, it's going to be a campy movie. It won't be that good, but it'll be, you know, something to watch with Alan Tudyk in a horror movie. Yeah, okay, I'm cool with it. I was blown away. Like, the first ten minutes of this movie, I was laughing so hard I couldn't breathe. I kid you not, I had to pause the movie to regain my composure because I couldn't stop laughing. I couldn't even watch the movie because I was laughing so hard when I first saw it that it was just, I, I had no idea what was going on. I'm pretty sure I even restarted the movie halfway through because I had no idea what was really going on because I was just laughing way too much because it was so funny. And even to this day, every time I watch the movie and I know the punchlines are coming, I'm laughing hysterically. It is just such a good slap slasher horror comedy movie it's it's hilarious and it pays homage too to so many classic movies from back in the day the director of the film eli craig he watched a lot of horror classics like the hills have eyes wrong turn texas chainsaw massacre and he noticed that the backwoods people were always monstrous and villainous so he wanted to portray them as ordinary people and even subvert their usual fear inducing cliche so when he was brainstorming ideas with his co-writer, Morgan Jorgensen, they came up with two scenes. Long before they had characters or even much of a plot, the two scenes they came up with were one of the rednecks wielding a chainsaw while being chased by bees. <laughs> and this scene's in the movie. This scene is in the movie. And the other was the iconic woodchopper scene. Which, oh man, if you've seen if you've seen this movie, you know what I mean by the woodchopper scene. Oh man. It's so funny. I'll, I'll give this one away. I'll give the woodchopper scene away. Because I don't want to give too much away. Because I don't want to ruin the punchlines for when you watch it. But I'll give away the woodchopper scene. So they're chasing... They're, a whole bunch of stuff's going down. Series of unfortunate circumstances. And one of the teenagers ends up running into a fucking wood chipper while alan tudyk is trying to pull him out of the wood chipper and he's getting his body mutilated oh it's <laughs> it's hilarious it's i can't even explain how funny this movie is the design for the cabin in tucker and dale versus evil was actually based on evil dead and wrong turn Eli Craig showed production designer John Blackie pictures of both cabins from those movies and asked if he could make a hybrid between the two of them. Which I feel like they definitely succeeded with, because I remember too when I was watching the film, I'm looking at the cabin and I'm like, the outside looks oddly familiar, and then they went inside and I'm like, oh my god, they took the inside interior of the Evil Dead cabin. <laughs> which really adds to the flavor of the movie as you're watching it, especially if you're an Evil Dead fan, because you just know shit's going to go down, but you, you're not quite sure how. Now, without further ado, let's dive in. Let's talk about Tucker and Dale vs. Evil and all the hilarity that ensues in this movie. The film begins with a reporter and a cameraman being murdered, 
before the movie goes back in time. So we see that there was a whole bunch of murders that happened uh, by some redneck hillbilly back in the day. And then we get to move forward into the future. We see a bunch of college kids. Their names are Allison, Chad, Chloe, Chuck, Jason, Naomi, Todd, Mitch, and Mike. All generic college kids. You know, they're going on a camping trip in West Virginia. It's the typical spring break, gonna go out and party at a cabin. Typical horror movie trope. So they head out to a gas station where they first encounter Tucker and Dale. They are two well-meaning hillbillies. Great guys. Just wholesome, humble dudes. And uh, they just bought a vacation home, which is a run-down lakefront cabin deep in the woods. I'm sure you can see where this is going. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> now, the two of them see the college kids at the gas station, and Dale wants to talk to one of the girls. You know, he's feeling some feelings. So Tucker gives him some good old manly advice to try and talk to Allison. He uh, takes a scythe with him as he goes to talk to Allison. But because of his appearance, he only scares the girl and her friends because they see this hillbilly walking up to them with a scythe going, you guys going camping? <laughs> like, it's just... <laughs> Okay, I can't give away more of this movie for you guys, because if you haven't seen this, you need to see it. Okay, I might actually watch this again today, (laughs) after I record this episode. So now, Tucker and Dale are on their way to the cabin, the one that they uh, recently bought. It's their vacation home. They get pulled over by a sheriff, who warns them that the area is pretty dangerous, so be careful. So Tucker and Dale arrive at their decrepit cabin. And it's definitely, you know, a fixer-upper. So they begin to repair it. This is going to be their buddy project. They're going to put together this cabin so that they can have the vacation home of their dreams and turn it into a man cave. However, nearby in the woods are also the college kids. (laughs) Chad tells a story about the Memorial Day Massacre, which is what we briefly saw at the beginning of the film. It was an attack by hillbillies, which took place 20 years prior. So after the story, the college kids decide they're going to go skinny dipping. And coincidentally, Tucker and Dale are also fishing (laughs) at the same place that these uh, college kids are skinny dipping. (laughs) I'm going to try not to laugh every time I say something, guys, because I'm as I'm talking about the movie, right, I'm watching it in my head. And it's really hard not to laugh when I'm watching it in my head. That's how much I love this movie and how funny it is. So while the college kids go skinny dipping, Tucker and Dale end up seeing this going down. Allison sees them and gets startled, so she falls off and ends up hitting her head. Tucker and Dale, being the nice, you know, down-to-earth guys that they are, they go and try to save Allison, make sure she's okay. However, her friends see them dragging Allison's body out of the water into their fishing boat and believe that they're kidnapping Allison and that they've, you know, knocked her out. Allison ends up waking up in Tucker and Dale's cabin the next day, and she's initially scared. Of course, she thinks she's been abducted, but gradually as time goes over, Dale shows her that, you know, they're not necessarily bad people, they're just misunderstood. (laughs) The college kids decide that they're going to go Rambo and try and save Allison. So they show up at the cabin to to save Allison, while Chuck runs away to go get the police. Dale and Allison are inside the cabin, and hornets begin to attack Tucker, because he accidentally had cut a hornet's hive. This causes him to frantically start to go nuts in the woods, waving his chainsaw around, which the college kids totally misinterpret. (laughs) They think that he's trying to come chase after them with a chainsaw, when really he's just trying to not get stung by hornets. So they all scatter through the woods. Mitch ends up impaling himself on a broken tree, killing himself, of course. And after the uh, college kids found Mitch's body, Chad ends up persuading the others that they're in a battle for survival and they have to kill these hillbillies in order to survive the woods. The college kids end end up following Tucker and Dale back to their cabin and they see Allison is helping out with the construction of an outhouse. But they're assuming that she's being forced to dig her own grave. So the college kids attack but Todd accidentally impales himself on his own spear while trying to attack Dale, and Mike falls into a wood chipper when he lunges for Tucker. Allison gets accidentally knocked unconscious by Dale's shovel during this attack, and he ends up taking her inside to keep her safe. Now, the rest of the college kids who are still alive, they assume that the hillbillies are the one who killed their friends, and that it wasn't accidental deaths. They believe that they murdered their friends. Especially when they see Tucker trying to save Mike from the wood chipper as his body's being mutilated. Because it looks like he's just feeding him into the wood chipper. 
Now on the flip side of things, what's Tucker and Dale thinking, right? Like, Tucker and Dale see these kids fucking killing themselves, basically. So they think that the college kids are actually part of a suicide pact. <laughs> And their logic is, is that if they contact the police and alert them of this, they're going to be looked at as murder suspects, which is fair. They absolutely would. What cop's going to believe you that a whole bunch of kids came out to your random cabin in the woods and started killing themselves, right? Like, it's a good plot point. Now, at this point, Chuck arrives back at the cabin with Sheriff Gurr, who talks to Tucker and Dale and is obviously doubtful that there's a suicide pact going on. So the sheriff goes inside the cabin, and he accidentally ends up killing himself with a loose beam in the cabin. So, of course, he goes outside with nails in his face, and the college kids think that Tucker and Dale now killed the sheriff. So Chuck tries to be a man and uh, dies trying to threaten the hillbillies with a gun because he shot himself. And Chad reappears, attempts to shoot Tucker and Dale, but he actually only manages to capture Tucker. Chad then starts torturing Tucker by cutting off two of his fingers and then sends those fingers with a message to Dale to try and draw him out of the cabin. So Dale, of course, is going to try and save his best friend, right? So he leaves to go rescue Tucker and Chad and Naomi return to the cabin so they can save Allison. Allison, of course, tries to explain the situation, because over time she realized, you know, these, these aren't murderous hillbillies. <laughs> these, these are just a couple of nice guys trying to ha redo their cabin, basically. However, her friends accuse her of having Stockholm Syndrome. Tucker and Dale then return at this time, and Allison attempts to lead a calm discussion between Tucker and Dale and Chad. Chad then explains that his grandmother told him his father was killed in the Memorial Day Massacre, and his mother was the only survivor. Jason and Chloe then break in to retrieve Allison when a fire breaks out. Tucker, Dale, and Allison end up escaping. Naomi, Chloe, and Jason, they die. However, Chad is now insane and scarred and vows revenge on them. Tucker and Dale try to escape. They end up crashing their truck when they realize that Chad has now taken Allison to an old sawmill. And at this sawmill, Chad has Allison tied up to a log and is going to send the log into a saw. Dale arrives in time and rescues Allison, and the two of them barricade themselves in an upstairs office where they discovered there's news clippings revealing that Chad's father was one of the hillbillies responsible for the massacre 20 years ago. So there's our big bad, is actually Chad. Chad's the big bad of the movie. He wasn't one of the victims. Once this is revealed, Chad becomes enraged, and Dale throws a box of chamomile tea at Chad, which gives him an asthma attack. Chad starts convulsing and falls out the window to his death. The police and news crews end up arriving at the cabin and broadcast a news report stating that the deaths appear to be the result of a suicide pact and a deranged killer who was revealed to be Chad. And it's also revealed that Chad actually survived the fall. The reporter and cameraman, they're the same two from the movie's opening scene talking about the massacre. Tucker watches the report on the news while being in the hospital. Dale enters in and they discuss Tucker's recovery. Tucker then asks Dale whether he managed to invite Allison on a date. And he's happy to hear that the two of them are going bowling. Later that night at the bowling alley, Dale encourages a fellow hillbilly to talk to some girls and to just be himself. As Dale and Allison confess their feelings for each other and kiss, the other hillbilly accidentally knocks out a girl in the background, which is set to start a new misunderstanding of sorts. I hope I did that justice, guys. I really hope I did that justice for you in that it seemed funny enough for you to at least go check out the movie if you've never watched it. Or even if you have, give it a rewatch. It's one of those movies you can watch like 25 million times, and it would still be epic every single time you watched it. Tucker and Dale vs. Evil really subverts the genre and bends them in a way that's somewhat similar to The Cabin in the Woods, but not as stupid and campy. And the brilliance of this movie is pulled off within minutes of the film starting. So as we mentioned, right, like it starts with a group of college students, just like many horror movies do, and it's f the movie's first presented from their perspective. They stop for beer, they find Tucker and Dale, and this is the first time that they meet, and this is the trope that we've seen so many times in films, right? Creepy hillbillies stalking young people. <laughs> like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, of course, being the most iconic example of this, but it's been replicated in so many movies, right? Hills have eyes, wrong turn, etc., but then Tucker and Dale vs. Evil shifts the perspective to the characters Tucker and Dale. We find out they're just a couple of guys taking a weekend trip and that everyone's just jumping to conclusions on what their intentions are because of their appearance or the way they talk. 
But the great thing about this movie is that the filming itself feeds into how their behavior could be misperceived, right? Like, it's not a situation of, oh, how could you think that they would do that? Or how could you misunderstand that? No, the way it's filmed, you could totally understand how the college kids think they're getting chased down and murdered one by one. The whole film is the basis of a misunderstanding. We have the way the, that the college kids read Tucker and Dale at the beginning, which, you know, is sort of prejudice. But the beats of the film itself don't fit that bill, which is where the comedy comes in, right? Because you're just watching a film of two guys who are being dudes and putting their man cave together, where on the other side of it, there's kids that are fearing for their lives because they think these two are going to try and kill them. <laughs> Thinks they're like deranged, crazy hillbillies. And the other thing that makes the movie so funny is that this perspective of the college kids, it isn't unwarranted. Even though it's a wrong perspective, that's not what's going on here. It's not unwarranted. And the fact that at the end of the movie, Naomi responds to Allison saying that she has Stockholm Syndrome is, is completely makes sense based on everything these college kids have seen and experienced. I can't wait to actually get the Blu-ray DVD and watch the film from the perspective of the college kids. Apparently it makes it more true to like an actual slasher film because watching it from that perspective will give you a whole new outlook on the movie, I guarantee it. Now, of course, even though it's a horror comedy, every quote-unquote slasher movie needs a big bad, right? So Chad's our big bad for this movie. And honestly, I'm pretty sure he'll put you off from the beginning. Like, the guy's demeanor, his attitude, he attempts to seduce Allison when you know that she's just not interested. You know from the get-go that this guy's a fucking sleazebag. Like, you just, you know. And it just ramps up later because he gets pretty molesty like and just like he doesn't actually but he you know he's just creepy that's the best way for me to word it he becomes super creepy towards allison and he really acts like one of those spoiled rotten rich kids like i don't know for sure if he is they don't really say but he you can tell he wants to embody a certain ideal of what class means because he wears a stupid polo shirt with the collar up and he spits hillbilly like it's the worst thing he can ever say but the other side of it is is that the film kind of complicated this a little bit because Chad's biological dad is the hillbilly, the same one that, you know, raped his mom, did the massacre, and so on. And I'm not too sure about that moment because if the point were to cast any sympathy on Chad because of his background, it's not going to happen, right? We're not going to give this guy sympathy because of his background when he's this much of a douchebag and he's a murderous killer. I think it was more meant just to be a twist moment in the narrative, more so a opportunity to feel emotion or connectivity to the big bad. But that aside, you know, Tucker and Dale versus Evil really calls into question people's presumptions about one another. Because the college kids think that Tucker and Dale are just completely nefarious from the start just because of how they look. But these are good guys who are just themselves. And they don't understand why the college kids are freaking out. It's a real good lesson in misunderstanding. So that wraps us up for our discussion on Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. I hope you really enjoyed it. Now we're going to move into our Decade in Review series and talk about a 1983 John Carpenter classic, Christine. <laughs> 